to warn everyone, my uh, iPad decided to crap out right before I got on stage, but uh, we'll wing it a little bit. Um, thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. It's a great event. Um, so I know a lot of people here probably know about Uber. Tell me about uh, Ola and what makes it different. Sure. So I heard the introduction that we are the Uber of India. That's actually quite, uh, <clears throat> so there are a lot of similarities in the, uh, in the sense that we are a platform, technology platform for transportation. But the Indian context is actually very, very different. So to start off, uh, if you look at a macro level, 70% of Americans own a car. And only 5% of Indians own a car. And there are 1.2 billion people in India. And there are 300 million people here. So the, uh, <clears throat> the kind of platform that you need to build for urban mobility is going to be very different in India. Right? This at a very macro level. You know, and Indian streets are just clogged with traffic. If, uh, and some of you have been to India, you would have noticed that you just can't get around the, uh, the city very easily. And so that's what we believe is a very differentiating factor, and that's leading to a very different business model that we're building out. Okay, so I guess to start, be, before we even get to what your service provides, how do people get around beforehand? I mean, we, we like to think in the US we have taxis and a lot of people own cars, obviously. Um, what's the transportation market like in India right now? Sure, so people get around in four main ways, right? Uh, they own their personal two or four wheelers. It's not a very large amount. Like I said, 5% of the people own uh, personal cars. And every year, only 2 million odd cars get sold in India. A lot of people use public transport, which is either metros or local trains or local buses. And those networks are really, really crowded. And you, I'm sure some of you have seen photographs of people hanging on top of the, outside the doors or on top of the, uh, the buses, you know, clinging on for life. So a lot of people also use auto rickshaws, which is a three-wheeler open-air uh, Indian taxi, quote-unquote Indian taxi. And then that some people use taxis. So taxis have not been a scaled up uh, uh, system in India. You know, across the country, they were around, uh, before we started, uh, let's say 10, 15,000 odd taxis across the country. But there were more than a few million auto rickshaws. So mobility is a huge pain. Mobility is a huge need for every urban citizen. But they're fulfilling it either through public transport, which is very crowded, very uh, bad experience, or through auto rickshaws. OK. How do you? do that in a way, how do you create this industry and do it in a way that you know, makes it number one affordable sure. um, so that you can get kind of close to that price point on public transportation, but sure. also make it more convenient? Sure. See, the price point of uh, transportation in India has to be very, very low. You know, comp uh, the average ticket size we have, uh, our average trip cost for Ola in India is around $4 versus I think $20 for Uber or Lyft here. And the way you make that uh, low is, number one, uh, human uh, skill cost is very low in India. And there are a lot of people willing to become drivers, a lot of migration from rural India into urban India. And the first thing they can do is learn how to drive, go buy a car, and get on the road. And we've actually kind of enabled that in a big, big way. So we have tie-ups with car manufacturers, with financing companies, deep tie-ups. We, you know, we help them get a loan which is structured to their uh, requirements so that a lot more people can get into this ecosystem of driving others. Unlike the US, where there's a ride sharing uh, supply base, where anybody, you know, a private citizen owning a car, can also drive on, on a platform, that, that doesn't exist in India. The people in India who own cars are not the people who want the extra 10, 20, 30 dollars of income every, every day. Right? So the opportunity lies in enabling this uh, you know, unskilled base of population come into the ecosystem, help them buy a car, skill them up. So we have a huge investment in skilling up drivers. We have huge investments in enabling them to get loans. Well, maybe we can talk about that a little bit more yeah. um, because you know you have to find the drivers, you have to get them cars, yeah. you have to train them. Yeah. Um, it seems like that is really, really hard to scale mm -hmm. um, to do that in, in a massive way. Sure. So what have you built around that to make that easier? So we've built, uh, you know, we've been at it for around three years. I started the company in 2011. Uh, what we've done is we've built an infrastructure of uh, sourcing drivers in all, all of our 30 odd cities that we are in. And it requires a lot of manpower to scale it up, right? It's not a very lean model. That way we can't have just three people in a city. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> so, but we have, so we have a large feet on street team which goes, sources these people from wherever they live in the city or around the city brings them in, we have infrastructure to train them, and then we uh, have partnerships to help them buy a car. So. So one of the big issues that we have here um, and that you know, we frequently hear about is trust and safety. Yeah. And we'll hear isolated incidents about uh, Uber drivers um, acting badly. Like, how do, you, um, how do you deal with that? And how do you um, deal with public perception and get them comfortable with the idea mm -hmm 
of using this service? I think it, using Ola is a lot more safe than hanging out of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a serious, uh, on a serious note, uh, there are regular uh, systems that you can build in a marketplace like a rating system, et cetera, but those are most, mostly post facto. In India, because the quality is even lower and because we are upskilling people from, you know, earlier they were doing nothing to uh, getting them to drive cars, we do a lot of uh, pre facto training, audits, et cetera. So we have a you know, field, on, uh, field on street team which does audits of each car every week. Right? That's over and above the rating system that we have as a marketplace. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, we, so, so another point on that is we also do a lot of peer reviews. A thing that works in de developing economies is peer reviews, right? So if, if a driver, if we're onboarding a driver, he needs to be referred by some, uh, some friend of his or some uh, you know, colleague of his, or people who live in the same community. And that, you know, the community feeling is something we leverage. Okay, and, w and when you talk about you know, bringing on, you know, supply is one thing, creating demand is, is the other. Um, again, getting people comfortable with the idea of using a service like this if they haven't necessarily used taxis or sure. if that hasn't been available to them. Um, how do you do that? So I think uh, it, you know, people realize that they needed a better option than driving their own cars on one end and using buses or auto rickshaws on the other end, right? Uh, they didn't just have that option till we launched. And we've seen huge word of mouth, uh, you know, help us scale, scale very fast. Uh, we, we also do, you know, the regular advertising, et cetera, but what's worked really well is that there was a huge need for mobility for a, for a good mobility solution for the middle class. Right? The auto rickshaws was not that solution. Driving your own car is also not that solution in India. So what we're seeing is a lot of people, so I don't own a car. You know, I, I personally have never bought a car in my life. And uh, now, now because of what we've built, I don't feel the need to own a car. But a lot of people in India, especially the middle class, the upper middle class are not buying the second cars. Or they're not even driving the car or, or taking it out of the garage because it, if you take it out, you just you spend two hours in traffic. And more than the monetary cost that you save, you also save a lot of time in India by not driving your own cars. Okay. So I think one of the other things that we sort of take for granted here, um, we have infrastructure around payments, we have sure. infrastructure around uh, smartphones in a sort of a developing nation like India where you don't have very deep smartphone penetration mm -hmm. right now um, and you know payments are not what we're used to in terms of credit cards, like how do you handle those pieces? Yeah. So cash is king in India. Yeah, there's a saying, cash is king. Uh, you cannot build a business in India, even if it's an internet business, with, uh, unless you support cash. We saw that in the e-commerce uh, companies scaling up in India, they started scaling up only when they launched cash and delivery. And we launched only with a cash solution initially. And, but now we also offer a mobile wallet solution, which is the uh, solution which is, uh, which, is the, uh, which is as defined by the regulator. We, ca we can't necessarily do card and file because you need two second factor authentication, it's not allowed. Uh, so we have a mobile wallet solution, we have a cash solution, and we're seeing consumers prefer the wallet oh, gradually. You can't start with a wallet solution itself because consumers need to build that trust over time. So they use us, use, a, use us on the app, you know, initially pay with cash, and over time move to the wallet. When you, when you talk about the cash yeah. perspective, like how do you deal with potential fraud or people so I think being all, charged or that type of thing? All Indian businesses model that as cost of collecting cash. Okay. <laughs> it's a standard uh, line item in the PNL in Indian businesses. Okay, so you just <laughs> accept that that's something yeah. you're gonna have to do. You can with. optimize it to an extent, but there is you know, a cost of collecting cash. You, there is fraud, there is loss of cash, yeah. Okay. But it's not, see, Indian businesses have innovated significantly to be able to run cash businesses. Yeah. Right from the you know, uh, traditional businesses like FMCG companies, et cetera. Okay, how about the smartphone penetration piece? Mm -hmm. um, it's growing, obviously, but uh, how do you get the population that you know, might not have a smartphone. Sure. So we are not just an app company. Uh, we started off the company as a website to book uh, book cabs, and we also support a call center. And we are seeing uh, the mobile app percentage increase significantly. But as we go deeper and deeper into the country, into smaller cities, into tier two, tier three towns, call center is still the largest mode of uh, consumers calling us, consumers reaching out to Ola. And I don't see that changing immediately. Over time, uh, it might it'll change over the next one to three years, where apps will become significantly larger than any other uh, access uh, channel. You know, uh, and so that we've seen that happen in tier one cities. So across the country, I think every year we sell 10 million smartphones, and that number is just accelerating. So hopefully in the next two years, it'll, it'll change to you know, 90, 90, 95% apps, but right now we're at around 75% apps. Okay. Backstage, before we uh, came up here, you said that you took an Uber uh, <laughs> here today. 
Uh, they're, the, they're the Olaf of the U.S. Right? <laughs> Olaf of the U.S. <laughs> What do you think about them as a competitor yeah. um, and, you know, the potential for them in yeah. a market like India? See, Uber is a good company. Uh, they started off, they're, they're the ones, to give them credit, who created this category worldwide, right? But there's only so much benefit that you get by scaling the same product internationally. And in businesses like these, there's a lot of local innovation that you need to do, right? You need to add value to the local consumers and local suppliers which we have built from day one. We started the business with understanding local supply better, with understanding local demand better, and that's resulted in a very different business model. For example, we collect cash, we allow you to book on our call center, we have a different, much more deeper way of engaging with our drivers, right? So, and that's also, uh, you know, that has led to a market scenario in India where we own 70% of the market, and we're growing faster than Uber. And Uber's been in India for one and a half years. It's not a new kid on the block in India. But you need to innovate for the local markets. So do you think that that's something that they're not able to do or not willing to do, or are they just happy to get the lowest hanging uh -huh. fruit in that market? See, I think they will uh, do that slowly. That's the, that's the challenge every multinational company faces, be it Amazon in China, be it eBay in China, or you know, these companies in India. Uh, <clears throat> you, know, you need to innovate for the local market. And over time, these companies realize that uh, you do, and Uber is doing, so essentially in India, Uber is following us. So we had a very low cost hatchback taxi category we called Mini. And then recently they launched their own category in that space. But you know, that changes the table, the terms of tables. We are the leader, they are the follower there. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that there's, uh, as this market plays out, do you think it'll be more like uh, market to market winners or will there be one huge global player and then um, in certain developing markets you'll have a local winner? I think in large economies there'll be local winners. So China will have a local winner, India will have a local winner. Uh, in, in the developed world, I feel Uber will, uh, it's already pretty dominant and will win most of it. It's like a homo re relatively homogeneous uh, market. Uh, maybe in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, again, the, a local player might be able to win. Because, like I said, there's a lot of local innovation you've got to do. So is your sense that, you know, the Uber user in India is not a local, it's someone visiting on business or a tourist or something like yeah. that? So a lot of Uber users in India, uh, in India are the you know, expat kind of people who are, who are traveling around countries who like the seamless Uber experience in different cities across the world, right? Uh, but when you build for the mass of the population, uh, you've got to build uh, very local solutions. Another example that we've recently done is we launched auto rickshaws in India, right? Uh, and we don't see ourselves as disrupting the taxi business because there's no taxi business in India, right? So we are co-creating the entire mobility space. and. You know, India is going to create a very different paradigm on uh, on mobility platform. Uh, so we work with the auto rickshaws also now, and that's that business is growing very well. Auto rickshaws are happy with us. We don't fight them. We don't fight their unions because we are working with them. Okay. How do you kickstart an entire market that doesn't exist? Hmm. That's the eternal question, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of any marketplace. Yeah. Uh, see, as a uh, as a first time entrepreneur, had I known it was going to be that tough to kickstart a marketplace, I wouldn't have ever started the company. But in hindsight, uh, what you realize is you've got to put in the uh, effort of it has to be lockstep. You know that that was my experience, and we started off in a organic fashion. We didn't raise a lot of capital and then start off the company. I bootstrapped the company three years ago, three and a half years ago, and uh, what we realized was you get some suppliers, you know, show value to some consumers. It could just be your friends and family and then it takes off from there. And the nature of, you know, luckily for us, the nature of this industry is, especially in India, there was a huge gap to be filled, right? And that was what helped us scale very fast. But, but now you've raised a bunch of money, and I, I'm wondering, like, as you look at the market opportunity, is it just India? Is that, you know, what you're solely focused on, or do you see yeah. yourself expanding and, yeah. and bring this model to other markets? So one of the inspirations uh, for me starting off was Jack Ma, and, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely a legend, and, he has this saying that he would rather be the crocodile in the Yangtze than the shark in the ocean. And I believe huge local markets like China and India give that company a huge opportunity just to put the heads down, build deep value for that country and that market. And India is a huge market, the 1.2 billion people, it's 20% of the world. Right? I would rather solve for the mobility needs of these people than take one small product worldwide. Okay, so you, you, you keep calling it mobility needs, yeah. but there's a, there's a lot that you've built and there's a lot that you've learned in terms of uh, local logistics and that type of thing. Sure. When you look at uh, companies like Uber experimenting with local delivery and, and other services based on the same infrastructure, is that something that you're uh, looking at or thinking about? So uh, 
there is definitely, uh, so when I, when I step back and abstract out what we've built at Ola, right? Uh, we've built a real-time logistics framework, a real-time peer-to-peer logistics framework where traditional uh, courier companies or uh, you know, FedEx kind of companies have a hub-and-spoke logistics framework. And there's definitely value in uh, leveraging that in a country like India where, you know, to transport other goods. At some point, we'll definitely look at that. For example, this, so there's an Indian festival called Diwali where a lot of, uh, the tradition is that you, you give gifts to your friends and family. And on, on Diwali, we had a very interesting uh, campaign where it was a marketing campaign where on Ola, you could send a gift to anybody, in, uh, you know, any, any of your friends or family in our 30 cities by just pressing a button. And the gift would reach him in, thir- in 10 minutes, right? From the point of you thinking of, the, of sending the gift to reaching, the gift reaching him, and you paid through your Ola money wallet. So we will definitely, that's something we can definitely scale for India. It, it's still an open question, what can you, what, what kind of categories will work well on the real-time logistics framework? Okay, are you, are you testing them, though, outside of, outside of that? Uh, nothing in the public domain yet. Okay, okay. Um, when you think about, um, you know, building this sort of infrastructure, uh, what other opportunities are there, um, since I, I feel like, you know, you probably know, you know, how to get around a lot better than, you know, Google or whatever, some of these non-local players sure. that have done logistics maps, that type of sure. thing. Uh, so when you talk about opportunities, you're talking about logistics or yeah. beyond in the yeah, economy? Logistics, like yeah, logistics, like beyond just mobility. Uh, actually, I didn't understand your question. That was lo- lo- logistics yeah, yeah, beyond. What are, what are the other things that you can do with the infrastructure that you? Okay, have? okay. I think that there's a lot of uh, opportunity to sell. You know, whatever consumers need in 30 minutes to one hour, we can ship it to them. Right? Uh, there's a lot of leverage we can get from our existing fleet. To give you an example on numbers, Bangalore, which is one major city in India, has 100,000 auto rickshaw guys. 100,000 auto rickshaw guys. Uh, that's, that's a lot of people. <laughs> and uh, you know, those people, and, and all of these people want more revenue streams. And if, if we can help them ship stuff around, I don't know what that stuff is. I don't think it's, you see, it's peer-to-peer courier service where you want to send an envelope and all. That's not big in India. But may, maybe it could be something else. Who knows? Okay, excellent. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here in the audience and giving the hand. Thanks, guys. I wanted to give a 